Welcome back uh, from the weekend. Uh, why don't we get started? This is one of those mornings of migraine, so sometimes I might need to pause every once in a while. Um, all right, so administrative. Uh, so you should have the reading done by now uh, and uh, gone over uh, the C essentials in four hours. Uh, that's not the only uh, C tutorial out in the world, uh, but I thought it was a particularly good one. And again, as, as I had said in the past, you are not required uh, to use uh, code blocks. Uh, it's there for you to use if you choose to. Uh, you can use whatever IDE uh, suits you, but when you hand in uh, your project uh, submission, uh, you must uh, write a make file, right? A make file that can be run from the command line uh, in Linux environment. Any other questions? Yes? No? Okay. So originally today I was going to spend probably about half the time doing some programming, but I thought I'd uh, shift that to Thursday's class meeting and spend today uh, getting through more of the material. And this all sort of weaves into uh, uh, itself between what we did last time at the command line uh, running a C program and using system calls uh, in particular. So please make sure you're keeping up with the reading. The book is an easy read, uh, but there are quite a few pages there and it can sneak up on you uh, before you know it. So make sure you're doing uh, stuff every single day. All right, so where we left off, we talked about uh, touchscreen interfaces, if memory serves me. And this uh, depicts, this picture is a touchscreen interface for iOS. And um, in iOS, uh, one of the biggest uh, breakthroughs uh, for usability is that you don't need uh, a mouse, right? You use your fingers to point to things because, you know, you've been pointing using your hands, your fingers, uh, since you were an infant. And so along with that, uh, for um, enacting with this touchscreen in different ways, there are so-called gestures uh, that this touchscreen senses. And so um, there is an API, set of API calls uh, available to you on iOS that you can write uh, touchscreen gestures or recognize touchscreen gestures in a program uh, that you write. But nonetheless, things like pinching uh, to minimize something or stretching the opposite of pin pinching, swiping, and so forth. In addition, um, these things also have gyros, uh, these devices, and those gyros uh, read uh, what's called the pose in robotics, the, the position and orientation in three space. Uh, and using uh, changes in pose, you can do things like turn your tablet, and it'll read that, and you can use that as other types of input device uh, for uh, your uh, touchscreen interface. Uh, there are also voice commands, things like Siri, uh, Alexa, uh, Google, uh, what's it called, Google Voice, or I can't remember what the name of it is, um, or Hey Google, or however you turn it on, or wake it up. Uh, and those voice interfaces are coming online, and they're getting better and better over time, and, you know, maybe 20 years from now, you'll look back uh, to 2019 and say, my goodness, things were so primitive then, right? Because I looked to when I was an undergrad and uh, things were very primitive then relative to now. Uh, and so one of the interesting things about these future interfaces, things where you don't physically have to interact with your hands or, or a mouse pointing device, is that these things are very important for accessibility. So let's say you have someone who does not have the use or full use of his or her hands. Certainly they can use their voice and there are all sorts of so-called neural interface uh, that research is still being done now at various universities around the country. So imagine in the future, you know, you put an electrode somewhere on your head and just by thinking something, it deciphers uh, those thoughts into words that you then use uh, to interact with your device. And so uh, the future of so-called human uh, user, uh, human uh, interaction um, is not just things like window icon menu pointer, the so-called WIMP interface, it will also include sensing, right? Um, and you see that already now uh, with that RGBD camera uh, on uh, iPhone 10, right? It can read the contours of your face, right? So we're only just getting started uh, in, uh, with that uh, in, as a research community. Okay, continuing on. Uh, so this is the Mac OS X GUI. It's not very interesting as the usual windows, icons, menus, and pointers. Um, and, you know, you uh, click and you drag and you can uh, type in names and, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, this just presents a nice uh, graphical accessible uh, interface on top of what underlies it, which is uh, a variant of the BSD Berkeley Systems 
uh, division uh, uh, Unix, right? And so you can absolutely uh, program it from the command line or program it using what's called the POSIX interface, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about that in a few slides. So let's take a look at system calls in particular. Uh, one of the things we did when we wrote our program, we used printf, right? And that printf uh, took uh, the text uh, that was given to it uh, in the command, and it um, wrote it out to the screen, to the console, or to the terminal. And now that's one example of a system call, and system calls in general are the set of services or the way that your programs uh, use services made available uh, by the operating system. Now, these system calls uh, often come in what are called language bindings. Uh, there are libraries of functions uh, that are available in different languages, and usually uh, they're fairly uh, low-level languages, often called systems languages, things like C and C++. And so you have these language bindings in C and C++, and, you know, Java has some, but Java isn't really a systems language per se, uh, because the whole purpose of Java was to make uh, your programs portable uh, from one physical uh, computer architecture uh, to the next. Now, um, mostly when you access system calls, you can access them directly as system calls, but for the most part, uh, language bindings offer APIs that try to gloss over some of the details of system calls in effort uh, to make it a little bit easier uh, to write your programs. And so there are lots of APIs available that do this uh, for Windows. The main interface is called Win32. Now you might be thinking, gosh, well, isn't Windows 64-bit? Well, yes, it is. Uh, Win32 is the historical name for the underlying uh, APIs. Now, when you use a lot of these libraries available in the Windows Software Development uh, Toolkit, or SDK, um, it uses, if you were to look at the source code for those SDK calls, it will uh, ultimately boil down to uh, Windows 32 uh, API calls. Likewise, there's something called POSIX, and POSIX stands for the Portable Operating System Interface, which is supported on every uh, Unix uh, platform, be that BSD uh, or Linux. Now, being a BSD variant, Mac OS also supports the POSIX interface. So if you were to Google search and look up what is the POSIX interface, you'd see a standard set of APIs for all sorts of things like creating processes, terminating processes, um, you know, opening files, closing files, reading and uh, moving around or seeking uh, in files and so forth. And the whole reason for those APIs uh, is to make it so-called compile time portable, meaning that you can take a C code uh, written uh, against the POSIX APIs for system calls uh, and take it to another Unix variant, recompile it, and the program just runs after recompiling, right? Uh, and so if you look what happened historically, well, they said, gosh, well, uh, why just have what's called compile time portability? Uh, why not have binary portability where you don't have to recompile it? And in order to do so, you need a consistent environment, and that consistent environment is a virtual machine, and that's where Java came along. And now um, Java and Sun Microsystems, they didn't invert, uh, invent, rather, uh, the virtual machine that was pioneered by IBM uh, back in the 70s as a way of implementing uh, multi-user uh, operating system environments. Okay, and so we have these APIs, and you can have different APIs and language bindings, and one of the things that the language binding in Java offers you is an object-oriented approach uh, to presenting all of the many system calls. So, for example, if you're going to uh, implement uh, network communications on Java, you'd say new socket. Right? Uh, you don't have to uh, create the socket and then select whether it's a stream socket or a datagram socket. You don't have to uh, check the file descriptor for the network card and all that stuff. You just create a new socket, and in the constructor, in the implementation for the socket object, uh, it does all of that stuff for you. Right? Uh, so the whole goal behind these APIs and language bindings uh, for these different APIs uh, is to make it easier for you uh, to implement uh, programs. Okay. So here's an example, and this example is in the book, an example of all the different system calls involved. And there are very many system calls involved in something very simple, even something like copying a file. So on the command line, you might issue a command like copy, CP, uh, in uh, the CLI command line interface, uh, in.txt to out.txt. Now, the semantics of such a command from the command line, you have the command name, CP, which is actually a program that's run. So what would happen is when you type this command and hit enter, uh, the command line interface takes uh, these three pieces of text, cp, in.txt, and out.txt, 
The first one is the program that it runs, so it looks somewhere in the file system, creates a process, and runs that program. And then the second and the third pieces of text on this command line are the so-called parameters, right? It's what this command or what this program is going to operate on. So the first uh, piece of text, in.txt, uh, it's the name of a file, and that's going to be the source of the copy. And the second uh, piece of text on the command line, out.txt, that's going to be the destination, bless you. And so this program is going to take the context of a file called in.txt and copy it uh, to the file uh, out.txt. Now here, there are no directories and things like that specified, but you can imagine, bless you, um, a source file that's in some directory. You would just uh, proceed this in.txt with the full path uh, to wherever that's located and do likewise with out.txt. So a lot of things happen underneath the covers, and we're going to get some experience using this for the second project, or not this, but uh, using more of the system calls. We just have to get you warmed up uh, with the first project. So first you have to acquire the input file name, right? And that's given to you as a parameter uh, in the main routine, that entry point, and we'll actually get some experience at another time uh, doing this. And then you prompt to the screen, right? So maybe, you know, you have to decide if you're going to have the user type in the name or if the name is given to you uh, when you run the program, as is the case here. So you acquire the input file name and you prompt if you need to, and then you accept uh, the input, right? You have to get this text, uh, and it's obtained from an array specified uh, to your main entry point, the main uh, function in your CPC file, right? Defining what it means to copy. And then you're going to acquire the output file name, right? Uh, you're going to accept that input. And now this is a particularly important line. You're going to open the input file. So that's going to also require a system call, right? Uh, and this open is going to accept a, t a file name, and that's going to trap to the kernel, and it's going to do whatever it does for its implementation, which is beyond the context of this discussion. Um, to actually physically go to the right location, the right platter, the right track, the right sector on uh, the disk, and go ahead, uh, move the read write head, and go and read those file contents. So then it's going to create the output file. And in this particular uh, case, the assumption is the output file should not be there because you don't want to overwrite it. So it's considered an error state for this uh, example uh, if the output uh, out.txt already exists on your file system somewhere. If it's not there, then it uh, uh, goes ahead and proceeds. If it is there, it's considered an error. Likewise, on the input side, if the input file does not exist, it's considered an error and the program exits or aborts, right? That exiting of the program, that is also a system call, okay? So now you're going to loop, and that loop is going to do two things. It's going to first read some amount of text uh, from the input file, assuming it's been successfully open, and then write that same amount of uh, text or information uh, to the output file. And so the amount of bytes that it reads should also match up with the amount of bytes it's going to write. So you have to manage that. And so you're going to loop until you get to the end of the file, the input file, and then you're going to go ahead and close the output file and close the input file, and you're done. Right? The program terminates normally. So that's a lot of things going on underneath the covers, right? You could use copy CP from the command line, but you are perfectly capable, uh, given what you know now, um, to write a program like this. Okay. Any questions? Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what a standard API call uh, might look like. Now, this is what you get if you use the so-called manual pages, right? Uh, or you could Google search it, look on Stack Exchange or what have you. I don't expect anyone to memorize this. It's an exercise in futility to memorize it. Uh, you get used to it when you use it, right? So please, I expect you uh, to have references and look stuff up. Um, I'm always uh, asking people to cite their references, um, but for the assignment, it's okay uh, to use references online or from books and what have you. And so the so-called manual pages, when you run that from the command line, it'll give you uh, information about all the system calls available uh, in POSIX interface. And so how you invoke the manual pages is with the command man for manual pages, and then the name of the system call, like say read. Okay. And what it'll do is give you text kind of like what's in this white box here. And this white box will tell you uh, first 
what header file you're going to include, right? Header file from before is a piece of text that you uh, include or you can read off and paste in as part of your C program. And so in C, this number sign include is a so-called C preprocessor directive. And the first thing that happens when you run the C compiler is it runs a C preprocessor. And these preprocessor commands, number sign include, number sign define, and so forth, uh, tell the C preprocessor to do something. And so what this include directive does, it says, okay, go to the file system and look up this UNISTD uh, dot h so-called header file and that header file contains the definition of a whole bunch of functions made available uh, by the operating system and usually these header files are grouped based on the types of operations they do like standard input output uh, string uh, memory manipulation and so forth and so here you and i uh, standard um, unix input output uh, you and i std dot h and it says the function call function name is called read now, when you call this function, it's going to return something, and that return value in this particular case for read is the number of bytes that it read, right? Uh, so that's how you know if your read was successful and uh, if your read did what you expected it to, right? Because if it doesn't read the number of bytes you specify, now you have to save them and read some more and read some more and read some more uh, because it's not always the case. Uh, that the disk will be able to buffer the number of bytes that you ask uh, to be read, okay? So you might need to issue more than one read call, okay? So read has a number of parameters that it takes. One of them is a so-called file descriptor. It's an integer type, so int fd. And a file descriptor is what the operating system's name is for that file. So when you say open a file, you, for your convenience, you give it a text name, and the operating system goes off to the right track, uh, sector, and platter on the disk, and it goes ahead and starts reading that file. But in order to remember where it left off when it did a read, uh, it has a data structure, and that data structure holds that track, sector, and platter information. So if you're going to read, let's say you have a file, and that file contains a megabyte, and uh, you read the first 100 uh, bytes from it. Well, you need to know where you left off if you're going to do a subsequent read to continue on reading, right? And so that data structure manages all the bookkeeping for where it left off. And that particular data structure instance associated with the file that you've opened is accessed by indexing into a table. And that table index is called your file descriptor. And so the file descriptor for the read is needed so that it knows where it should continue off uh, from. Okay. We also have void star buffer. Now, void is like saying the anything uh, data type. And what this buffer is, you'll notice here, there's a star there, so that means it's a pointer variable. And what that void star buffer is, you need to give your read operation a memory location where it's going to store the information that it read from that file, right? Because you're getting it from disk, and it has to go somewhere in memory. Where in memory? Well, that where in memory is pointed to by this pointer variable called buff, right? And it's called a void star because you don't care what type it is, it's how you use it um, will determine how it's read out. But from the perspective of the underlying read call, uh, it can be any kind of pointer, and that's what that void star uh, means. Okay, and so lastly, the size t count. Size t is a user defined type, and we'll talk about type deaths and user defined types and structs on Thursday as it pertains to pointers as well as static variables. Uh, but the size t you can think of is kind of like an unsigned integer, but we'll just leave that to just be a count, right? Uh, so what this last thing is, this count, says how many bytes do you want this read command to read? So if you give it uh, a 1024, it'll read out uh, 1024 bytes, or try to. If you give it 100, it'll try to read out 100 bytes. Now the reason why I say try to is because if you give it some number of bytes to read, and remember underneath the covers what's happening on our von Neumann architecture. Uh, we have the bus, we have uh, the memory, and we have the I.O. controller, which interacts with the disk. Now, that I.O. controller maintains a buffer, so it reads off the disk into the buffer for the I.O. controller, and then sets up the transaction, whether through direct memory access or through the CPU, sets up a transaction to transfer that data that was read off disk uh, to main memory. Now, of course, that 
buffer in the I.O. controller for disk is only a certain size. So if you specify more bytes to read from the file than will fit in that buffer, read will only fill that buffer up to its capacity. And then it'll return telling you this is how many bytes that I've read. So it's up to you and C to manage. If you say read 100 bytes and it only read 50, you now have to do a subsequent read until the size T or the return value return adds up to that 100 that you desire. Right? So you have to manage all that in C. Now in Java, you do a buffered reader and it does all that for you. Right? It's a convenience. But in C, you have to manage that counting yourself of how many bytes were read. You have to manage all of that yourself. Okay? So we have read. Read returns uh, a value, and that value represents the number of bytes read. Uh, you give it the file descriptor, descriptor rather, so it knows where to pick up when it uh, reads from the file. You give it a buffer, so a pointer to memory that tells it where to store uh, the information that was read, and then the number of bytes of type size t, the count for the number of bytes that you want to read. So this is fairly typical uh, of a system call. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? And so the best way to understand it is to use it, right? And so you know certainly we will have an assignment that uses more than just one or two system calls, um, but um, you're welcome to you know go to Stack Exchange. You'll see a code snippet. Stack Exchange is very good for that. You cut and paste it, compile it, link it, run it, and see how it works. Right? Engagement is the name of the game here. All right. Any questions? Make sense? Okay. So, system call implementation. So you might wonder, gosh, well, how is this implemented? Yes, we did talk about the fact that you trap to the kernel, and the kernel then performs this uh, details in its so-called runtime. It does the details of what that system call is on behalf of that program, and that user program gives the kernel the information it needs uh, in the form of parameters. So when you call read uh, from your user process, right, uh, that file descriptor, that buffer pointer, and that count, all of that is given to the operating system so it can perform the details of read uh, on behalf of the process uh, user program that called this. And so this interface uh, is implemented in the operating system runtime as a table. Right? So you have a table of system calls. And so from the perspective of the operating system, you know, read might be system call 13, uh, write might be system call 14, um, socket might be system call 28, I just made those numbers up, uh, and so forth. Right? And so literally the operating system indexes uh, into a table of system calls, right? and you can absolutely add to this if you have the source code to Linux, um, and it then performs the details of what that system call uh, does underneath the covers. Now, of course, uh, when you trap to the kernel, when you're running a system call from your user process, one of the things that happens is the mode bit is set uh, to kernel mode, right? Because the kernel is performing these privileged operations. Okay, and then, of course, in the reverse direction, when the system call returns, uh, the status or the return type from the system call comes back to the kernel with a mode bit switch uh, back to user mode. Okay, so the caller doesn't have to know anything about the system call's implementation. And, you know, if you think about it, that's kind of a protection me mechanism. Somewhere in the read operation is a system call number, and that's all that's specified to the kernel. All it knows is that it called this thing, uh, and it's going to return, and it's going to return back with some values, and the operating system is going to fill memory specified by that buffer pointer. Uh, it's going to fill that with the data that ultimately came uh, from the buffer uh, of storage uh, managed by the disk I.O. controller transferred to RAM. So the so-called runtime is what you refer to when you talk about the operating system's implementation. It's just some algorithm that runs and that algorithm is triggered uh, by indexing a table and that table actually uh, it refers to a function pointer and it executes a function among uh, the many functions for the system calls. So here's a schematic uh, about what happens, and this is in particular for the open uh, system call. So if you're going to open a file, you have to open a file before you read it. So here we have our user application up above. You issue the open system call uh, from uh, among the system calls offered to the uh, processes, user processes, uh, through uh, the system call interface like POSIX or uh, Win32. So then you trap to kernel mode. And you know it's a certain system call number, system call I in this particular case, the ith 
system call is open for whatever I is. It indexes into the table and then it calls into the OS runtime uh, the implementation uh, of that open. So now uh, open does whatever it does in the runtime and then returns back. And uh, when you return back, uh, you go back to user mode, of course, uh, flipping the mode bit uh, so that you're back in user mode to maintain protection of these uh, system resources. So certainly, like we saw with the read system call, you have parameters. And these parameters have to be communicated, if you will, between uh, the user process and the operating system. And there are a number of ways uh, this is done. Well, the first is using uh, registers. So let's say if you have something simple like a count, how many bytes should I read? Well, that's one of the uses of the register file that we talked about when we discussed the von Neumann architecture, in particular, what's inside of the CPU. Uh, but we only have a limited number of registers in our register file. You can look up any chip spec and it'll tell you. It's usually uh, multiples of 16, right? Uh, so you don't have that many. And what happens if the parameters are more than will fit in the available registers in your register file? Well, one of the things you can use is memory. And the other way of passing parameters across the user mode, kernel mode, seam, if, as it were, when you're issuing a system call is to put all of those parameter values somewhere in memory and then take a pointer to that block of memory where uh, the parameters are found and then store that pointer in one of the registers from your register file, right? So that way you're using a pointer when you call across the user mode to kernel mode seam when you do that trap. Uh, and when you execute the system call, uh, the system call, the OS runtime, then refers to that register to get the pointer value so it can access memory in order to get those parameters. Now, of course, memory is much bigger uh, than those registers in the register file in terms of the amount of storage. So if you have many, many parameters uh, or a lot of information corresponding to the parameters, uh, you can use uh, system memory. Likewise, you can also push them on the stack. Now, the stack um, is exactly the data structure that you, we, you talked about in data structures. And uh, the stack exists in RAM. It's a special region of RAM. And when you push something, right, you're allocating on the stack. When you pop something, uh, you're deallocating. And the semantics of the stack, of course, is last in, first out, right? So you can actually take those parameters uh, when you make your system call from uh, user mode, push them on the stack, and then communicate that stack pointer, uh, store it in a register, and then when the OS runtime runs the implementation, the details of that system call, it then refers back uh, to that stack to get those parameters. Okay, any questions about this? Make sense? And so like RAM, well, the stack does exist in RAM, you can store a lot more parameters in RAM than you can on your register file. Okay, so this is an example of using a block of memory um, to pass parameters between the system call and user mode uh, to the OS runtime in kernel mode. So on the left-hand uh, side, we have uh, this blue box here. Those are the parameters you need for the system call. In the case of read, you have the file descriptor, which is an integer. Uh, you have a buffer, which is a void star, so it's a pointer. Uh, and then you have, uh, I think it was a size t, uh, the count, the number, of uh, bytes you want to read. So all of that is put in memory somewhere, and then you acquire an address here, load address X, and X is going to be the address in RAM where all of those parameters were allocated. So now system call 13 is specified, so the number 13 is inside the implementation of that read API, and there's no secret about it. You can actually go into the Linux source code and look at the implementation uh, of that system call and actually see which system call it is. Uh, so system call 13 is specified, you trap to the kernel, and you're over here on the right-hand side in kernel mode in the runtime in the operating system. So then it refers back to this address uh, to use those parameters, and then it implements uh, the actual details of that system call, right? And you'd have the code associated somewhere uh, for system call 13. And so the operating system knows it's system call 13, uh, the user process thinks it's, whether it's a read or open or so forth, uh, but the user program has no idea uh, what the operating system is doing. All it knows is that I can expect back a certain result uh, when I specify some parameters and issue this system call. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Make sense?
Okay. <clears throat> so let's kind of journey a little bit through the very many types of system calls. And these aren't exhaustive, but they're just sort of a sampling of the types of things you can do with system calls. And certainly, as the interfaces get more and more complex, your system call libraries are going to grow. Okay, so there's process control. Of course, that means the creation and termination of processes. Uh, you can, within a process, end it or abort. So that says, okay, reclaim all the resources uh, associated with this process and return them back to be available and uh, uh, allocatable to other processes. Uh, you can load and execute programs. You can get process attributes. So things like permissions and other things like runtime and things like that associated with uh, processes. Uh, you can tell a process to wait for a specified amount of time. So you're using timer resources there, and there are instances where you might want to do that. Or you can wait when a certain event occurs in your system, right? So uh, in something called asynchronous I.O., let's say you, you write to a disk. You want to wait until that disk is ready with that information in this local buffer in that I.O. controller associated with the disk. Uh, you want to wait until that buffer is ready with information. Uh, and once it's ready with information, you want the system to tell you about it so you can now take action and do something with it. So not only can you wait for a predetermined amount of time uh, specified by system call, you can also wait uh, and trigger your wake up uh, based on some event happening on your system. You can allocate and free memory. We talked about that a little bit, and we'll get some experience with that on Thursday. Um, you can also dump memory if there's an error. Right? If there's some problem, uh, there's an error reporting mechanism called a core dump that you can actually tell your system uh, to write out a bunch of information about the status of the registers, the status of memory, and so forth to a file. So then after the fact, you can interrogate it and report it back. If you ever um, see a pop-up on, say, Mac OS, and it says, report this back to Apple, right? Uh, it's basically taking a core dump and sending it across the wire. Uh, back to Apple so they can file bug reports and see what's going on with the system because no two operating instances of an operating system are exactly the same and bugs still occur. Uh, you can do debugger operations. It's not just unique to a debugger, but there are system calls for doing things like single stepping through your code, execute just one statement at a time. Uh, you can also specify locks uh, and it's a special construct uh, that allows the orderly or sequential uh, access to resources. Uh, and there are other types of counting locks called counting semaphores uh, as well. File management, you can create and delete files. You can open and close them. You can read them, write them. You can also reposition where in that file you're going to read or write. Sometimes it's called seeking uh, in a file. Um, you can also get and set the file attributes. So maybe you want to change the permissions of the file uh, to allow certain uh, user identities to be able to read it and write it and so forth. You can look at attributes of your devices. Uh, you can also attach devices. This idea of a network operating system allows you to connect to uh, a remote disk and make it look like it's local to your system. It's called mounting a hard drive. And so there are system calls for doing that as well, in addition to local devices like USB and other arbitrary devices. Um, you can look at information, uh, things like your system clock, uh, things like system data, like the operating, uh, how much it's using swap space, that special area of memory where it stores pieces of programs, uh, to look at uh, process attributes and device attributes. So a device uh, on Unix looks like a file, and you can specify permissions for who can read, write, or execute things on a device. So there are system calls for doing that, uh, called I.O. control. Uh, communications, you can create and delete communications connections. Uh, you can identify hosts, you can resolve addresses for hosts, and there's a whole semester of computer networking, more about those details, but we still have to talk about it, not as much as we would in networking, but we still have to talk about it as it pertains to uh, being an operating system service. Um, communications, there's communications between two machines, but there's also communications uh, between processes that are both on the same machine. And one of them is shared memory, right? So you can take the memory available to a process and make it readable and writable by another process. And this is called, at least on Solaris Unix, it's called pinning uh, a memory page. And when you pin a memory page, that leaves that data in memory. So now you don't have to read and write the file all the time. So imagine you're doing uh, image processing or computer vision, and you want to extract certain information 
uh, in a so-called processing pipeline, right? Uh, one stage might say, look at all the edges in this picture. Another stage might say, compute a histogram of these edges to try to discern what the object in that image is. Now, it's an expensive prospect to keep reading and writing an image from disk, to have one process read it, do some processing, write it back to disk. Rather than do that, it's a tremendous savings if you have the first process in the pipeline, read it from disk, process it, leave it in memory. The next process just attaches to that memory, um, a so-called pinned memory page, uh, and then just does its part in the processing pipeline. And so the shared memory is a really, really important way uh, and fast way for processes to send information to one another. You can transfer status information. You can also attach these remote devices. That's a form of communication. Uh, protection, you can control access to resources. And so that means the creation and management of access groups as well as entities or identities uh, for those access groups. OK, this um, is just a smattering of different types of system calls. The Win32 uh, APIs are in the center column. And then the POSIX uh, commands system calls, just the function name, but not the parameter list, are, are on uh, the third column. So of course, you can create processes. And these are very different. Windows tries to be quote unquote friendly. And so their uh, system call names in Win32 are a little bit more wordy. So you'd say create process uh, in Win32. Uh, in POSIX, you'd say fork, right? Fork a process, meaning to take a process and make it two. And in the beginning, when you create a process in POSIX, you're basically creating an identical copy, and then you load the new program in one of those copies. OK. Uh, file manipulation, uh, we saw the read earlier. It's called read file in Win32. And I'm not going to go over all of these. You can get the process ID uh, identifier. It's how your system identifies each process. It's called get PID in Unix. It's called get current process ID in Windows. So uh, the big takeaway here is that while the system calls do the same thing, on these two different platforms, Windows uh, and Unix, uh, the system call can be quite different, right? Both in terms of the signature, i.e. the name of the function, as well as the parameters and what their meaning is. OK. Any questions about this? No questions? OK. We might finish early today. So this is an example from the standard C library. Again, uh, C is a so-called systems uh, language. And like any program, of course, you have to use the system calls uh, on a, a per system call basis. In this particular case, this program is going to call printf. And you'll notice here the first line in this program is to include standard I.O. So there's a number sign include preprocessor directive stdio.h. Now, that um, angle bracket means that it's a system library, right? Uh, you can create include uh, files or header files of your own, but you're just going to have open, close quote and not the angle brackets. OK? Uh, so the first thing you do is say, OK, well, I want to paste in my program, my C program, all of the function definitions that allow me to do standard input output. And one of them is printf. Uh, the other is scanf. And there are a couple others. Scanf allows you uh, to prompt for the user to type in something at the keyboard. OK, so we include uh, the system call uh, header files. And then we have our main, right? That's our entry point, as we had discussed before. And then you have a bunch of statements here, one of which is printf. Now, printf, uh, every uh, command in C or every statement is terminated with a semicolon. So we have a semicolon. If you can't see it, that is a semicolon. Um, and then we have a return. You'll notice this return says return 0. And for Unix, or more correctly, POSIX, it is the case that when a program returns, it has to return an integer. And if that integer is 0, it means there was no error. right? And there are standard error numbers uh, for each program. And we won't go into them, at least not today. But if it's error number 1 or error number 2, that means something uh, to uh, the parent process that called this. Uh, if it's the command line interface, it's going to assume that error. And you can script them together. If it's another process, it's going to get that error. And each of these errors has a standard meaning in the POSIX library. So we come along, this program gets loaded, and the statements get executed. And we call printf. And printf has a system call number. And it also has a parameter. And that parameter is this string here, greetings. Now, whether you use registers or whether you use uh, memory or the stack, 
uh, it doesn't matter, they use one of the three or a combination of them. Uh, this greetings here that is the parameter to that particular system call. So when we trap to the kernel, two things happen. Let's assume that we use the table method. This greetings uh, string is put in memory somewhere and a pointer to it is uh, inserted into a register uh, on your register file. So we have the pointer to this greetings in memory as our parameter and um, the trap to the kernel, to kernel mode, the mode bit is changed so that we're now in privileged operation and the kernel uh, looks up uh, that position in the table associated uh, with the printf and that's the write, write to the console. So in the implementation of the write system call, it's going to take that pointer value from the register file, access that parameter, which is a string, and it's going to go ahead and write that out to the console. And you see that uh, as the text coming out to the screen. So now that system call exits because it's gotten to the end of the system call in the operating system runtime. And then we return back to user mode, switching the mode bit back to user mode. Uh, and then we return back to the program that called that system call. Okay. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Okay. So we also have different types of environments, and it's important or it was important, and DOS is not very uh, important anymore, uh, but it was a very early, back in the 80s, it was the dominant uh, operating system, uh, if you want to call it that environment. Now I say that sort of tongue in cheek because DOS, or disk operating system, was a very, very simple operating system. It was an honest goodness operating system, but it didn't offer you very much. It was single tasking, meaning you could only run one thing at a time. And I remember when I was an intern back in college, I worked on uh, 123 for DOS. And, you know, it ran on top of disk operating system. You'd boot your machine and come to a single command prompt, and that was it. And so the first thing you'd do is you'd run Lotus 123, and the spreadsheet was its own operating system, right? Because DOS was single tasking, whatever program you ran, it had full control of all the resources on the machine. Now, that might seem kind of crazy by today's standards, uh, but back then, that was what it was. So when you wanted to print something, it was up to your program to interface with a device driver and actually push bits out to the printer, which for the most part was directly connected to the machine. Now, of course, I remember when uh, Novell Netware was the big deal, and that was one of the first user uh, type of office environment uh, networking um, stacks. And the whole purpose for Netware in the beginning was to share peripherals, because I remember a simple laser printer uh, that you'd have, you know, for like $300 from Staples, that thing was thousands, like $10,000 uh, back when I was an intern, right? And so because they were so expensive, uh, they often wanted to share them. And that was one of the first uh, big usages of networking uh, programs was to share expensive devices like uh, laser printers at the time. And so DOS was so-called single tasking and the shell was the first thing that was invoked, uh, the command line interface, and you'd come up with a prompt when you booted it, and now you could just run something. And so it's very simple. You'd run a program, and then when you exited that program, you were back to the command line interpreter. So the setup at startup looked like the following. You'd have the operating system kernel in the low part of your memory, right, close to memory address zero, and then you had the command line interpreter code. So the first thing the kernel would do is run the command line interface, and it was just waiting for you to type something. Okay, so now you'd run your program like Lotus123, uh, Microsoft Word didn't really exist there. In fact, when uh, Windows was very new, you would run Windows after running DOS, and you could have what's called a batch script, such that when your shell first booted, your command line interface, it would run a quick batch file, and that batch file would say run Windows, and you could actually boot up into this graphical environment. And one of the big deals about Windows back in the early days was that you could switch from one program to the next instead of that one program having sole uh, exclusive access to all the parts of the machine. But nonetheless, when DOS booted up, you had your kernel um, and then your command line interpreter, which was run, and the rest of memory was completely free and clear. Now, it wasn't a lot of RAM, all right? Um, the thing of having a gig of RAM was a big deal, big deal then. You didn't have gig of RAM then. It was hundreds of kilobytes of RAM. A five gig hard drive was absolutely huge uh, back in those days. So memory was free. And then when you run your program, it would go to disk, it would load it in memory, and there would be your process sitting in RAM. 
and running. So then when your process exited, all of this memory allocated to your process was now free and available for the next program that you would run. It would go back to the command line interpreter and then um, get ready to run the next thing when you type the command. Okay. Any questions about this? So it was very simple, right? Uh, and if you think back to, uh, or if you consider how people used computers there, uh, one of the big applications was electronic spreadsheets. And so a typical person would have a desktop, and the desktop ran one application. And if you were an accountant, you'd be running a spreadsheet application. If you were a writer or, an, or a news uh, reporter, your uh, computer would be running a word processor. Now, granted, back then it wasn't a graphical word processor. It was just a, a text word processor. Maybe you're too young uh, to, to have seen them, but Google search it and you'll see examples of it. Uh, but the model there was you had one computer and you were running, for the most part, one application uh, for the better part of the day, uh, depending on what your job function was. So this kind of fit. Uh, for what that model was. So then, you know, Unixes were already around at the time, right? Uh, what I described with DOS was for so-called personal computing, but you still had uh, multi-user operating systems at that same time, and these multi-user operating systems, many times they were used uh, by large organizations like to take the census, by the government, uh, by uh, large accounting firms, not, in, not small accounting firms, and at universities uh, as well. And so with these multi-user operating systems, you had multitasking, and as such, multiple people had terminals attached to this uh, CPU, and they would all want to have their programs run. So of course, uh, this environment had to allow for more than one process available in memory, and it also had to allow for the switching uh, of execution from one program to the next. Now it would do this very quickly and so you as a user sitting at a terminal while your programs were all running on the same computer uh, you didn't really notice too much uh, because it would just switch from process A to process B to process C and so forth and it would give each process a little bit of time on the CPU and go back to the first one and continue that scheduling. And so you'd log in and when you log in you're given a command line interface and then you type a command or the name of your program to run it. And this command line interface would start out and fork or create a sub process for your program that you're running. So the command line interface or interpreter uh, was running. And when you type something, it was just creating a new process for your program, right? Uh, and then when your program exited, that command line interpreter would be there waiting uh, for the next command. And so the layout in memory still had the kernel sitting there at the bottom, but you notice now, bless you, uh, you had a bunch of processes in this particular figure, and it's in the book, process B, process C, and process D were off somewhere in memory. Now, of course, if you had all of memory in the early days, you didn't have all of memory filled up. Once you know memory was filled, you were done. You couldn't run anything else. Uh, and that's why memory management was, was invented uh, to get over this issue where you had more programs or processes that you wanted to run than you could physically fit in memory, right? Uh, so part of what this uh, multi-user, uh, multitasking operating system did, FreeBSD in particular, uh, was to manage the allocation of where in memory all of these many processes sit, and each process was still associated with a single person. And so your experience uh, in the computer room or the computer lab, as it was called at the time, was that you'd have your own terminal and you thought that you had your own computer, but you really didn't. You were sharing uh, one computer, which had a lot of power, uh, but each user still had a single process he or she uh, was running. Okay, But underneath the covers on the system, you had multiple processes scattered about memory, and it was switching uh, between them. Okay. So there's a system call there called fork in POSIX, and fork says, create a new process, and that new process is considered my child process, but that process can run, and it's a unit of scheduling on the processor, right? And then when that process exits, the parent process that created it is notified, right, through the reporting mechanisms called signals, uh, and then um, you go back to the command line interface. So the command line interface was the parent process that called this fork uh, that creates child processes or new processes on the system. Okay. Any questions about this? That makes sense? Okay, what time is it? 
So let's take a look at some of the system services. And um, you know, these should be very familiar at this point because uh, we've already covered quite a bunch of it. Um, so these system programs, when we look at these language bindings, we said before, it's to make things a little bit easier. So we lump them into a bunch of types depending on what parts of the system uh, they interact with when you're dealing with the OS runtime. There's file manipulation, uh, status information, as we said, uh, support for programming languages. So the ability uh, to run programming languages, so that's the programming language libraries, to be able to load them, to attach them to programs, um, communications, background services is really important, so-called daemon processes. And so on any system, it's not just the software that you run, but the many different programs that are running in the background. So there's a reason why your email still gets delivered, even though you don't have your email program open. There's a reason why you know, your graphical desktop continues uh, to be redrawn, uh, even though you're not doing anything specifically to impact that. That's because you have a lot of system processes running in the background doing things for you. It's why when you run Dropbox, right, you can continue to get file updates even though you're not physically running a program. Okay. So most users, and you know, for many of you, your only view of the operating system is based on the system programs you use and not the system calls. But because this is an operating system class, we're certainly going to cover some of those system calls and give you some experience uh, in using them. Right? And even if you never have a career in the operating system interface, I hope you do uh, remember and consider what happens in the operating system because that helps you to write better software, especially when you're dealing with specialized software like, say, cloud services or you want to have scalable websites and so forth. It's really important to understand how the operating system manages the resources underlying your application. Okay, so system services, providing a convenient uh, environment for program development and execution. So not only uh, do uh, systems, operating systems uh, run the hardware, they also provide an environment for you to be able to develop. So some OSs have these libraries that allow you to easily access parts of the system. Um, they also include uh, compilers and debugger environments and hooks for debugging to make it easier uh, to debug your programs. Uh, file management, the abstraction of so-called directories and folders and things like that, makes it easier for you to manage the information that you have on your disk. Also, status information allows you uh, programmatically to get information about how your system is doing. Right? Um, some uh, operating systems, like the Windows products, have something called a registry. And that registry is used to store configuration information in a central database rather than having that scattered around your file system associated with every program. Now, on Mac OS, they have what's called a resources fork. Uh, if you look at an application in Mac OS, it's a, really a directory, a .app directory. And if you go inside that directory, you'll see the program executables, but you'll also see the resources. So Mac OS decides that you're going to keep these resources associated with each file, uh, um, associated with each program, and not in a central repository, whereas Microsoft Windows keeps them in a central repository, a database uh, called the system registry. OK, so which one is better? It just matters not <laughs> just on your application and your philosophy. Um, distributing them with the application means that they're very tightly coupled. And when you remove the app, it's easy uh, to remove the associated information, config information. Um, some believe that having it in a central location means you can make it faster and you can look stuff up about the program uh, very easily if it's in one place. So it all depends on your philosophy. Okay. Um, file modification. Some uh, operating systems in their systems environment allow you to edit files so they include a very simple file editor. Some of them are graphical uh, like gedit. Some of them are very simple from the command line like vi and emacs. Um, you can also install more sophisticated editors, things that paint nice buttons and give you all sorts of interesting fonts. It's really up to you uh, what you want to package uh, with your system, but um, many operating systems for their system services offer you a way to edit files. Uh, programming language support, things like assemblers and debuggers. There are other specialized tools uh, that you can also add uh, to test for things like memory leaks and memory violations. There's a free product called Electric Fence, which is pretty good. And there are also profilers. Profilers is one that they typically don't cover in software engineering courses. A profiler 
uh, is a language library that you include with your program. And every time you call a function, it increments a counter. And what it does is gives you the statistics on how often each function in your program is being called, whether it's a function that calls a function or it's just a flat function or what have you. And the idea there is when you display these statistics, uh, as the terminology is in profilers, you have what are called hotspots. The hotspots are the functions that you use the most. And if you want your program to perform very well, very fast, uh, you want to identify uh, the most frequently called functions or the hotspots in your program, and then you optimize them to be fast. Because if you can make most frequently called programs, the hotspots, if you can make those fast, uh, you're going to make your program fast. And so a profiler, um, when you get to industry, if you're choosing to go to industry, um, you will uh, at some point touch upon a profiler. And programs like NetBeans, and I know Unix has support, and major operating systems do, uh, profiling is another really important part of the programming language support because it allows you to write more efficient code. Okay. Any questions about this? So kind of a whirlwind tour. Um, some of it we've already talked about, uh, but in the context of the book, uh, they present this uh, as system services. Okay, so we talked about loading and execution. I won't uh, belabor that. And communications, um, I won't belabor that as well. Okay, background services. Now, there are some really important system services uh, that are launched at boot time. And this is where things like the process that sits in the background that repaints your screen. Whether you know it or not, uh, there's a program that's running in the background and it's redrawing your buttons because your button might have moved, right? And so every time some event happens, let's say you take your mouse, you click on the screen, it's checking to see if that mouse is over that real estate in your screen corresponding to a button, right? And so these types of programs, things like also your file system, especially if it's a file system that is connected to another server, a remote file system, you have processes that run in the background that manage things like this. And these processes um, are so-called background services, and they typically run when you boot your system uh, at, pro, uh, at pro, uh, a system startup, and they're terminated when you shut down your system. That's why it's a bad idea to just unplug your machine, right? You want to shut it down gracefully, because when you shut it down gracefully, you give these many system services an opportunity to kind of save stuff from memory to disk and to exit gracefully. When you just unplug your machine, you're not giving these system services a way to save state gracefully so that you can restore properly. And you ever notice from some uh, machines, if you were to just pull the power cord, the next time you boot it, of course, it takes all this extra time to now check things and stuff like that. Now, for file systems, it's especially important, but nowadays, uh, many systems have so-called journaling file systems. And what a journaled file system is, is exactly as the name uh, might imply, um, is that it writes down little entries periodically about where it left off. And so when you unplug the machine on something like Mac OS, um, because Mac OS has a journaling file system, it will now read those journal entries to reconstruct where it left off. Now, journaling file systems, while they give you more resilience, the cost that you pay for that is in the slowdown for writing these journal entries or these uh, uh, system state entries uh, periodically. Okay? All right. So all sorts of background services, uh, like checking your disk, uh, looking at process scheduling, uh, these are known as daemons in the Unix world. Sometimes you call them subsystems or system services. And application programs, um, there are some uh, application programs that are not really part of the operating system per se, uh, but they're really important uh, to your system. So, you know, if you're on Mac OS, the newer versions, uh, this thing called the AR kit, right? The ability to do augmented reality applications. <coughs> That's an important application program, excuse me, that's not part of your kernel, but it is certainly an important part of your operating system. And so these are a set of high-level APIs that make the job easier in writing uh, these augmented reality types of applications. And so some application programs, they're not considered part of your operating system, uh, but they're very important. Uh, things like reading your mouse click, right? Now, reading a mouse click is specific to the mouse. Yes, there's I.O. that occurs, but the actual, you know, did you double click or did you single click, right? Uh, that logic is uh, not part of your operating system. That's an important system program um, that runs in the background. Okay, so let's take a look and we'll end with this. 
um, linker and the loader. Oh, maybe not end with this. Uh, linker and loader. Now, we talked about uh, the linker uh, when we did that example C program. And at that point, we said uh, this linker is responsible for pasting together the object file that you create for your program, excuse me, uh, with uh, the library of implementation of these system calls that you use available in the operating system. And so you start at the top with your C program, and we ran GCC, the GNU compiler collection, dash C says compile this thing, and the last thing we specified was the name of the C file, right? So this says run the GNU compiler uh, collection, GCC, uh, compile only, that's what the dash C does, and then main.c, what is the C file that you want it to compile? Now the result of this is going to be an object file, main.o, and that object file is the translation by the compiler of this C file, which is in high level, to uh, machine code, which is the ones and zeros that mean something to the chip architecture. Okay, so now you have your so-called object file, main.o, and that main.o might call printf, or might call file open, file read, file write, and so forth. But at this juncture, when you have main.o, you don't have any implementation of what it means to file read, file write, and so forth. That comes from the operating system runtime. And the operating system runtime makes this available to you um, through the header file, that's so you know what the function uh, takes as parameters and the function signature and the return type, but the implementation, parts of the implementation, I shouldn't say the whole implementation, parts of it are in a so-called object file. And so when you link this line here, you're running the linker, and the linker is invoked uh, by running GCC, the GNU compiler collection, and we write GCC space dash O, that means go ahead and link. Uh, the result is going to be main, the main program, so that's our ultimate executable. Main.o is what you want it to link. Now what you're doing is you're linking main.o to a system library that has implementations, parts of implementations, uh, for calls you're using from the operating system. And so in this particular case, that dash lm is a directive to tell it which library you want it to use. Now we didn't do that, and we'll go over a little bit of that on Thursday, because we're going to spend probably the majority of Thursday continuing on uh, with the C programming parts. And so you specify a system library that has implementation associated with the functions that you used and specified as a header file when you did this number sign include. So now it's going to paste together system libraries with this main.o and call the result main, our executable. And the result of that is your executable file. So when you run this main, that main will go ahead and that has a single package uh, and it has all now the implementation of your code but also the implementation uh, of things that you're using from the operating system. So there are two ways of doing this uh, linking. One is called static linking, and one is called dynamic linking, right? And it has to do with the way the operating system's library is pasted in with your code. Okay. So with static linking, you have this library of routines that are joined together physically with your compiled object. So let's say you had, you know, um, you know, uh, libarkit.a, right? And that was physically pasted together with main.o to make your main program. So now you have one big block of code that has a copy of the system libraries along with your code. The dynamic linking is a little bit different. That dynamic linking, when you paste together your object file with something from the operating system, you're just pasting together the name of the library in the operating system. And it's once you run your program, you ran main, it's going to look for that object and load it dynamically. It's called dynamic, dynamic, uh, dynamically loaded libraries, right? So static linking says physically this library is pasted onto your object file as a single uh, package. Uh, dynamic loading says that you only have the name of it, and once you run it, you're actually going to load it. Now, the interesting part, you might ask, why would you ever do it the other way. Well, the reason why you have dynamic loading is that it's recognized that you don't need to load the library uh, for the system unless you're going to really need to use it, and that's when you run your program. And so on Windows, um, these dynamically uh, loaded libraries 
are called DLL files, right? If you ever go to your Windows Explorer and you look around, you see some file name .dll. DLL stands for Dynamic Load Library, right? Um, on Unix, it's called a shared object, a .so file. So if you look in directories on Unix, BSD or Mac OS included, you'll see some file name .so. SO stands for shared object, right? So on Unix, this dynamic load library is called a shared object. On Windows, it's called a dynamic link library. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? No? All right. So I really um, budgeted for more questions. Uh, it's 10.38. We're till 10.45. Uh, so if there are no further questions, um, I'll just end here. No questions? Any questions? Make sense? Yeah? All right. So with that, um, we'll end here, and I'll see you all on uh, Thursday.